Hi there. Welcome to Houston Baptist University's Psych 5310, Ethical and Professional Issues in Psychology and Counseling. This is Module 4. We'll be covering Chapters 6 and 7 in this module. Chapter 6 is a very important chapter. It deals with confidentiality. Now, confidentiality, privilege communication, and privacy, these are all terms that are related, but very distinct. Confidentiality is rooted in your client's right to privacy, and it's at the core of effective therapy. If your client doesn't feel like their confidentiality is protected, they will be hesitant to open up with you. So it is your counselor's ethical duty to protect private client communication. Privileged communication, on the other hand, is a legal term that generally bars disclosure of confidential communication that was made to a psychotherapist from any judicial proceedings or a court of law. Privacy is the constitutional right of individuals to be left alone and control their personal information. There are always some exceptions to confidentiality and privileged communication. Therapists are legally and ethically bound to protect others from harm. So some things you need to consider and you need to know the answers to these questions. What are the ethical standards that refer to your profession? And when are you legally required to breach confidentiality? When are you legally allowed to share information? What conditions warrant disclosure of this information? These are all important questions that are covered in the textbook, so please read carefully. The duty to warn and protect. Balancing your client's confidentiality while protecting others or the, in the public, this is a major ethical challenge, and it differs from state to state. Now, Texas, in which Houston Baptist University uh, applied to all Texas rules, Texas ruled that mental health workers do not have a duty to warn and protect their clients' known or intended victims. So if someone reveals in the course of their therapy that they intend to do harm to others, Texas has ruled that a mental health worker does not have a duty to warn and protect the intended victim. But it's going to be a difficult situation for you anyways, right? If you're in a state other than Texas, you need to look up your legal precedents regarding the duty to warn and protect. Protecting suicidal clients. Counselors must take a cry for help seriously. The expectation is that you must complete a comprehensive assessment of clients who have expressed some intent to harm themselves. A suicide risk assessment requires identification of risk factors, warning signs, and protective factors. You need to consider all of these. Failure to conduct an adequate assessment could lead to a malpractice claim that could threaten your license. <clears throat> We also have a duty to protect children and the elderly and any dependent adults from harm. These are all vulnerable populations and mental health providers are mandated to protect them from abuse and neglect. Confidentiality expectations do not apply when it comes to a vulnerable population. It could be a client reveals that they are being harmed. It could be a client reveals that they are harming others. The failure to report this abuse or neglect could make you legally liable. The states provide immunity by law from civil suits that may arise from reporting suspected child abuse or neglect. So if you report, um, you are provided immunity. Okay. If, if it's investigated and found not to be true, they will not come back to you um, and sue you or take your license away. You did what you would consider due diligence in reporting a potential for harm. Chapter 7 deals with multiple relationships. Now, if you live in Houston or a big city, it's multiple relationships are harder. But if you suppose if you lived in a small town, you might um, have your hairdresser as your client or uh, other things like this. So in all things, whether you accept someone as a client, you need to consider all of these things. Could the dual relationship be avoided? How could it be avoided if so? Could the multiple relationship potentially cause harm to the client? If harm seems unlikely, then would the additional relationship provide benefits? Would it prove beneficial in any way? Could the multiple relationship potentially disrupt the therapeutic relationship? 
So if you're doing business with them and seeing them as a client, there's potential for actual harm and a disruption in the therapeutic relationship when billing and money would come to, into play. And then am I capable of evaluating this matter effectively and objectively? So this chapter has a lot of information in it. How to establish and maintain appropriate boundaries, different cultural perspe perspectives, controversies and potential advantages of boundary crossings, small towns and the difficulty with multiple relationships, bartering for services, can you accept something other than money for the pay, receiving gifts, uh, sexual attraction to your clients, just say no, this is never okay, and non-erotic touch of clients, can you touch them on the shoulder, on the back, what, what is acceptable touch in the client um, professional relationship. So this video is very, very far from comprehensive. So